welcome to another Clear Mountain conversation, another Clear Mountain interview. Today we are so happy to have the Venerable Master, Dharma Master, Reverend Hung Shur with us. Uh, I'll give a bit of a biography of the Dharma Master and then we'll jump into questions. So uh, Reverend Hung Shur is an American Chan Buddhist monk and senior disciple of Master Sun Hua. Currently spending half his time serving as director of the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery and half on retreat in Queensland, Australia. After receiving his master's in Oriental languages from the University of California at Berkeley in 1976, he met his teacher, Master Hua, and took ordination soon thereafter, being given the Dharma name Hung Shur, meaning constantly real. He is perhaps best known for the peace seeking two and a half year, 800 mile three steps, one bow pilgrimage, he and his companion Hung Chao, Martin Verhoeven, made from South Pasadena to the city of 10,000 Buddhas in Ukiah, California uh, in 1977 to 79, on account of which is featured in the books with one heart bowing to the city of 10,000 Buddhas and highway Dharma letters. After serving as interpreter for Master Hua for many years, briefly acting as abbot of the City of 10,000 Buddhas in translating many sutra texts into English. In 2003, Reverend Hung Shur completed his PhD in religion from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. At present, Reverend Hung Shur lectures around the world on various subjects from the sutras to veganism and also transmit the Dharma through the unique Dharma door of banjo, guitar, and Buddhist folk music. We are so happy to have uh, the Venerable Dharma Master with us and yes, he's a, a very good friend of our greater uh, Thai forest tradition. So thank you, Dharma Master, for agreeing to meet with us. My pleasure, Ajahn Krovalo and Tan Ni Sabo. Uh, Namo fundamental teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha. Namo fundamental teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha. Namo fundamental teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be able to chat with you. I think this is a great idea. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, I think both, both of us have been admirers of you, kind of fans, monk fans of you for a long time. Um, uh, the first question which I wanted to ask uh, is regarding something which I, you know, as a young 20 year old, the thing which I found most inspiring about you was uh, the various different, what are called the Dutanga practices, the really tough kind of extra like uh, optional practices, which uh, go over and above what the normal rules of the monks that include, um, yeah, not lying down, a practice which you did uh, full-time for over 20 years, I believe, uh, eating 25. one meal. What was that? 25 years, yeah, yeah. which is uh, pretty much mostly even unheard of um, in uh, most monastic lineages. Uh, doing over 45 years of eating one meal a day, uh, your whole life being vegan, and even six years of not speaking, I believe. So right. these are very impressive practices. And uh, yeah, I've always been uh, very moved by them, but I'm curious if you'd be able to to say something about, um, yeah, what role in your life these difficult practices have had, maybe in light of Zen teachings, uh, which are, you know, emphasize the ever present nature of awakening. One might ask, like, why why torture yourself if awakening is always here? Why why do all these these hard practices? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Venerable. Thanks for the question. Uh, this, you know, this, this could, we could fill the hour with uh, the nuances of this. And, and I'm assuming I'm speaking to a monastic audience um, by and large. And uh, I don't know how many lay people would be interested in, in monks chatting, but um, the, from the point of view of the world where we want to be as comfortable as possible and mostly life has passed pursuing pleasure and fleeing pain, you know, the idea that you would uh, be vigorous in that way makes no sense at all. It's, it seems torturous. It seems 
like uh, you know, for monks, it's all suffering all the time, you know, which is really <laughs> a portion of the Buddha's message. And in Chinese uh, asceticism, dutanga, dutta, dutta in Pali, right? Dutanga. Right. Yeah. In, in Chinese, they say kuxing, bitter practices. Um, in fact, the experience of bitter practices is actually sweet uh, in that what it does if you and the, the there are 13, I think the lists from the Pali tradition to the Mahayana are pretty much the same. There within the Mahayana, there are several variations, which we won't, you know, scholars can can uh, uh, enjoy uh, comparing the, the lists. But what they break down to is body, uh, so food, clothes, and shelter uh, are essentially what the the Dutangas that as I understand them. Uh, involve. There is an extra one in, in my uh, personal uh, adopting of ascetic practices. We 100% were following the inspiration of our teacher, Master Shren Hua. Um, and we, I had been a Zeni uh, in Kyoto. Uh, after finding, I, I followed language to Taiwan in 1969 uh, in the summer with a summer program at Donghai University in Mandarin. And the group went back to the States in September, but I on my own went on to, uh, to Kyoto. I had, before I left America, I met uh, Gary Snyder, the, the poet who said, who was also from the Seattle you know, area. Uh, and Gary Snyder said, oh, you're going to Kyoto. He said, look up Ermgard Schlegel and she'll tell you what's happening in Zen in Kyoto at the moment, whether there's any temple that will let round eye foreigners, gaijin, in to live there. So uh, I did and Ermgard said, okay, you gotta go to Antaiji. She said, that's where Uchiyama Roshi is teaching and Uchiyama Roshi will, will take you in, you know, but you gotta be sincere. So, so that, was, that was my first experience with Buddhism. But uh, when I uh, when I came back to the U.S., I was enrolled in uh, Oriental languages at UC Berkeley and met Master Hua because my former college roommate in my undergraduate years had now become Bhikshu Hung Yo, had come to to uh, San Francisco and met Master Hua and shaved his head and put on a robe and ordained. So that was how I wound up at Gold Mountain Monastery in 1973. Um, so everything that I knew about being a Mahayana bhikshu was in Master Hua, uh, in the actual life as it was lived. Uchiyama Roshi was a Zen master and a wonderful teacher, a kind-hearted man and, and a person with some accomplishment, but he was also married. <laughs> um, and his, his wife, I, his wife was, uh, a bhikshuni, um, who, and I, I, they were exemplars of a modest and uh, virtuous life. There was no sense of anything being improper, but it was not a celibate monastic practice. And the, the idea of vinya dhamma, dhamma vinya, wasn't there in the, in the Soto Zen world. Um, so anyway, so when I found Master Hua's tradition, ascetic practices were what he did. And the story behind eating one meal a day um, in, is a personal story of Master Hua's, which was that he uh, came from a corner of Manchuria from Northeast China, where the invading Japanese armies had set up a testing facility that everybody now historically looks back and says the the Japanese doctor was the equivalent of Mengele, the, you know, making lampshades of human skin and all this kind of, you know, experiments on babies and, and starvation and just demonic evil stuff was happening in Master Hua's hometown. He was a teenager and a patriotic, uh, red-blooded Chinese, strong, strapping, tall man, but couldn't find his way to go to war. And so what he noticed, what he saw, he observed in his hometown was that his, 
his uh, older brothers, his neighbors had been um, impressed into work gangs. They'd been just basically forced into corvée labor. And Manchuria is a place of uh, weather extremes, very hot in the summer, freezing cold in the winter. And these workers were starving and freezing. They were given not enough food to eat, and they were given a, a basically a straw mat to wrap up in at night. So Master Hua said, although I can't defend my family, my larger family here, he said, what I can do is reduce my consumption of food and clothing. So he made a vow when he was a teenager to uh, take his, he could eat three meals, three bowls of food per meal three times a day. He said, I want to reduce that to three bowls of food once a day and see if I can't sustain. And although I'm not able to directly give the, the leftover six bowls of food to my starving compatriots, at least I didn't consume it. So indirectly, I'm making this offering. And sure enough, he was able to hang on eating one meal a day. And he, he had read already, we have a Mahayana Sutra called the Sutra in 42 sections where it says the Buddha ate one meal a day at noon. Uh, so he, uh, he said, I'll comply with the Buddhist practice and, and indirectly preserve six bowls of food. Likewise, he said, um, if I can make do with three layers of cloth to cover my body, then the fabric that I don't consume will still be available in theory, in the spirit of donating to my starving, freezing compatriots. And so he made a vow to wear three layers of cotton cloths, winter and summer. And so his, that was the crucible out of which came his personal vows, which then became, when he ordained, ah, so this is Dutanga practice. I'm already doing it. So we saw, and so Master Hua was um, very tuned in to America in the 60s and 70s and said, you know, there's lots of food being wasted here. He said, I, I grew up, you know, when I ate the potato skins along with the potatoes. I didn't peel the skins off the potatoes. I ate the apple core along with the apple. I didn't throw away the apple core because there wasn't anything else. He said, I know starvation and you are wasting food here as a nation. That's not good for your blessings. He said, you're going to exhaust your blessings by wasting food that you could eat. You're just throwing it away. That's not right. You're, you're harming yourself without even knowing it. So he said, um, I'm going to uh, encourage you to find, we're not going to spend money on food. So I was raised as a dumpster diver in my early years as a bhikkhu, as a bhikshu. We went to the Safeway in San Francisco, where you still could at the time. And I lived for three years that I was at Gold Mountain on uh, day old bread and slightly bruised vegetables and fruit. And uh, so we would come home from Safeway with just armloads of perfectly good thrown out vegetables that weren't sellable, you know. So this was the attitude. And to say it's, you know, torturing, the idea, your, your question where you say, you know, you're, you're, you're quoting someone who's, who would say, gee whiz, the Buddha nature is everywhere, why torture yourself? Well, you could say the same thing. The ground grows all the crops that every human and animal eats. Why bother farming? It all comes out of the ground, you know, so it's just, we know it's there. Why bother? Why work so hard, you know? Well, the answer is you have to actually plant the crops and grow them with the skill of a farmer. Although the Buddha nature is there, you have to uncover it. You have to cultivate it to realize it. Because we also, along with that ever-present Buddha nature, we have a full measure of greed and anger and delusion and pride and doubt, the five fundamental afflictions. So it's just like saying all of the gold in the world is under the ground. It's all mine. You know, I, I own all that gold, don't you know? Say, so, well, show me. Uh, well, it's still under the ground, but, you know. So, yeah, it's, uh, you have to actually cultivate it before you realize it. So do you need to go to extremes? I'm not convinced. For example, uh, after 25 years of sleeping, sitting up, 
uh, Master Hua one day came to me and said, well, John, he said, how come you're teaching all of my disciples how to sleep sitting up wrong? Look at your posture. You're doing it wrong. Why did you do it that way? I'm like, sure. You know? <laughs> he said, yeah, how come? You know, I, 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 but, but, but sure, I, you know. So I don't know the answer to that, Sherpa. I did it wrong. I wound up with a with a, a bent posture because my way of doing it, I slept at night in half lotus. I crossed one leg and slept like this. The right way to do it is il illustrated by a monk whose name was Haidang. Master Haidang was the abbot of Shaolin Monastery. He was the all China martial arts champion for 50 competitions. Uh, he was about five foot two and was the one who could do a one finger chance, one finger stand. That's never been duplicated. We actually saw him do a one finger stand, not a one hand stand, a one finger stand. Master Haidang. He did sleeping sitting up correctly. And the way he did it was in half lotus and that, just that, sleeping. I had to lean. I couldn't. I lasted this way about, you know, about an hour, and then I hit the floor. So I did my dutanga sleeping, sitting, sitting, sleeping up wrong. Um, during the pilgrimage, it was helpful while uh, Bhikshu Hung Chao, Marty Verhoeven, and I, while we traveled 800 miles, we had a uh, 1957 Plymouth station wagon, which was our traveling Bodhimanda. That was our, our monastery on wheels. And we took out the back seat and uh, Marty sat in the wheel well at night and I sat on the back deck. But in order to, to, do, to sit at night, I had to do that because the, the roof required me to do that. So I was touching the roof. Plus. So we slept sitting up in the Plymouth at night. That gave us a, sh a shelter from the elements Mind you, it was illegal, so it's not recommended. I don't encourage anybody to try to sleep on Highway 1, the Pacific Coast Highway at night. They'll, the police will happily move you off the, you know. So uh, back to your question on Dutanga practices. The Dutanga, the Sanskrit word, simply means to shake up. The Chinese translation is doso, which means to invigorate. And what's the purpose of that? It's not to torture yourself. That's that is a practice that doesn't lead to the Tao. You know, you're creating affliction instead of transforming affliction. The purpose of it is to allow you to come face to face with the limits of your life and your consciousness. Um, it is very easy, even in a mon monastery where lay people would say, oh my goodness, how can you possibly stand this, this dep deprivation? You know, how can you all renounce so much uh, and, and not understanding the joy and the liberation that comes from having enough and no more? You know, when you have an aesthetic practice focused on clothes, food, and sleep, you're always taking it to that edge where you feel the most alive. Mm -hmm. And it's not bitter, it's not torture, it's more a sense of how liberating to realize that one meal a day that of, of plant-based harmless food, ahimsa, just puts me so much closer to my awareness of my total interdependence on the earth, air, fire, and water of the planet and all beings' bodies and gratitude. Gratitude that just that the universe supports me, that I'm here to be able to breathe and to experience the that edge once you lose the edge even in a monastery you can get very comfortable to where you're just kind of dreaming from meal to meal that they say you know uh, a born drunk and dying in a dream you know just uh thinking this is life i'm life is good and if you can fill your stomach 80 percent and fill the other 20 percent with gratitude and say you know how wonderful to be able to cultivate the way one more day. You understand Dutanga practices. That's the point. 
I one more footnote here. I added to it um, our our uh, in we take the 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 Shramanera, the ten nab the ten Shami precepts, the Shramanera precepts before we take our Bhikshu precepts. So there's one the precept against holding gold, silver, or valuable objects, which Theravada bhikkhus are very familiar with. And in fact, they do a more thorough job than Mahayana monks on holding it. But Master Hua turned that into an extra dutanga. So he said, it is best if you can live without touching money. So for 25 years, I did not touch money. And it's not a strict dutanga, it's a precept. And I was closer, a lot closer to Theravada Bhikkhu's practice of, you know, of never touching valuables. Um, at once I became director or manager of the monastery, I had to uh, amend that practice to, to be able to keep to pay the bills. I did, we don't have that pure person uh, practice. So uh, eating once a day, sleeping, sitting up. Now I lie down to sleep. Um, and... I uh, still eat one meal a day, but uh, that's uh, now when I, if I were to, you know, uh, eat more, it would feel the, what's nice about eating once a day at noon is that night and the next morning when you meditate, you feel very focused because the, the body is not uh, running through the various processes of digestion. So your energy is very present. But uh, so anyway, long answer to a first question. Oh, thank you, uh, Reverend. And um, I'm curious about, uh, there seems to be two flavors of Dutanga you're speaking about. There's one that might be classified as the sila of simplicity or the ethic of simplicity with one meal a day, it's enough. Um, you know, wearing three layers of cloth, I believe that recollection is exactly almost as found in the suttas around this is enough. Um, I, I don't think many people would say walking 800 miles, bowing every three steps and sleeping upright in a back of a van is, uh, you know, the usual road to simplicity. So that that feels like in a whole different level of um, a, a level of faith and practice which is which is somewhat unique actually and, and distinct from these these other recollections which you've been sharing and I, I find sometimes the benefit of such things can be best exemplified and sort of as opposed to sort of a general uh rec reflection sort of a, a specific moment where something really emerged as an as an insight or uh, a distinct memory and, and I'm curious um, on that walking pilgrimage, uh, right. with that level of kind of faith and devotion, were there any moments um, that stand out in terms of you really seeing the, first of all, the deepest challenge and, and, and darkest part of that practice? Because surely, and I know I might, you know, it would be extremely difficult for me to do something like that, but also another moment or two where you saw the what came of it that was distinct and, and that you will remember in your life? Um, do you have two specific stories around that? Or if not that, then just a general reflection. Yeah, no, that's, I appreciate your question. And you, you ask it in a, in a uh, nuanced way that gives me lots of choices. That's nice. Um, I want to um, step away from the any, being special uh, yeah, among bhikshus, because, for example, when Theravada bhikkhus do a tudong, I think the spirit is the same. The idea is you don't know with that first step what you're going to meet. Will there will lunch come to you today? Are you going to get cursed? Are you going to get celebrated? Are you going to have a wet place to sleep tonight or a dry place to sleep? You don't know. You don't know. And uh, where is your mind going to travel as you as you go out and, and uh, walk with your, you know, you got your bowl just right and you've got your necessities and you've ideally you've got your, uh, your Dharma protector with you, Nick Scott protecting Ajahn Suchito in India, you know, he didn't know what he was going to meet. Uh, so there's, I don't think it's different um, in spirit. 
of course, the conditions, the individual conditions are different. And if I were to say, do I really understand why I uh, found myself silently bowing to the highway on the edge of America, um, reciting the name of the Flower Garland Sutra, I don't know. I have no idea why that happened. And to compound the I don't know, I think I've done it before. I have some evidence that this is not the first time I've done that. And my companion, uh, Bhikshu Hong Chao, um, Master Hua, when I told Master Hua what I wanted to do, that I had this inspiration, uh, he said, well, you can't go alone. And I said, well, who can go with me? Sure. And he said, he's not here yet. And it's like, what? Sure. Never mind too much false thinking, just bow, you know? So there was a, a lot of what, how's that again in the, the, uh, and I, I, among, among fellow cultivators, among our bhikshus, our greater bhikshu sangha, Theravada Mahayana together, um, I humbly uh, tell a story, tell stories that have uh, spiritual or mysterious or esoteric uh, aspects to them because those are very individual and you, you can harm somebody's body resolve by, by making them want to have some sort of mystical experience, you know? So I'm really cautious about doing that. But when it comes to the actual, you know, inner story of why, of what happened to me, I have to just say what happened. And I'll share that with you all, just among us, among, you know, whoever uh, in, in robes watches this broadcast. So, um, and uh, Ajahn, this may go out to others who aren't in robes as well at some point, but we can cut out any parts that you see right. fit to. Um, yes, right. sorry. So um, when I, uh, I finished my master's degree and followed my former uh, undergraduate roommate, David Bernstein, who is now Bhikshu Hongyo at Gold Mountain, followed him over. And I was still a, a lay person. I was, try, I was working as an electrician's apprentice to pay back my student loans before I left home. I still had debts to pay. So I was working with the intention of becoming a monk. And uh, I had moved into the monastery, but I was living as a, as a layman. And so I said to uh, Hang Yo, I said, well, now I can actually really commit to a practice. What should I start? What should I practice among the 84,000 Dharma practices? Which, which one is ideal? And he said, okay, why don't you bow to a sutra? And I said, what does that mean? And he said, here. And so he took a copy of the Chinese Avatamsaka Sutra, Da Fang, Guang Fu, Hua Yan Jing. And he opened it. He said, all right, start here. And he makes a full prostration. Thus, I have <laughs> heard, you know. And he, so he bows down the line. This is printed vertically. The Chinese characters, Ru Shi Wo Wen, thus I have heard, have I, thus have I heard. And he bowed every character on a page. And I'm like, that's too slow. That's just too slow. That's ridiculous. I said, I'm a grad, I'm a master's, a master's of arts, you know, at University of California. I speed read three books at a time. I keep my books with the spines open, stacked up so I can just, you know. And he said, yeah, right. And what single sentence from each of any of those books do you recall? I was like, well, I can summarize them. He said, no, you don't know. You didn't, you didn't retain any of them. He said, bow to this line of characters and tell me what it was. So I bowed, he closed it and I could recite it. He said, see, uh, hmm, well, maybe I'll try it, you know? So I started bowing to the sutra, sure enough, for people, you know, graduate students, we, we tend to be so head heavy, so word bound, uh, that slowing down and bowing to one sut one word in the sutta, sutra per bow. And I, there's another piece of it, which is you contemplate briefly the each Chinese character in your Dantian, in your 
hara, you know, your solar plexus. Just, just visualize it and let it go. So sure enough, it became my favorite practice. It slowed me down. And so I started bowing to the sutra. And we did our morning chanting and morning sitting. And then it was personal practice time. And so I would go up to the second floor of Gold Mountain Monastery, um, which is right in the Mission District on 15th and Valencia. I don't know if anybody knows San Francisco, but it's the oldest neighborhood. Uh, the, uh, it's actually the barrio, you know, it's a it's Hispanic ghetto. Now it's been yuppified, completely gentrified. So uh, there I was early in the morning, sun rising out the window to the east over the East Bay Hills. And I could hear seagulls and I would light a stick of incense and start bowing. And I would usually bow for an hour, usually two pages of the sutra per day. And so I kept it up for about six months. And then one morning, lit the incense, opened the window, felt the breeze come in, heard the birds and started to bow. And as I bowed, I realized that I was smelling salt air. And the Mission District is not, I mean, all of San Francisco is close, surrounded by water on both sides, but it's not close in the Mission. How come I was smelling salt air and feeling a breeze on the left side of my face? And as I bowed, I realized I was bowing on blacktop and there was someone standing behind me who was also bowing. And I was bowing to the sutra outdoors. And I kept on, just kept on bowing. And I could feel the breeze. I could hear surf. I could hear the tide coming in and heard the seagulls much louder. And suddenly I went, what, what is this? Why I'm not, you know, and oh, there I was back on the second floor of Gold Mountain Monastery. And for who knows how long I had been bowing outside heading north because the ocean was to the left and there was somebody behind me and uh, a friend behind me. And so that day I had my opportunity to, we took turns taking Master Hua his lunch tray up on the third floor of Gold Mountain. It was my turn. So I took the lunch tray up and said, uh, uh, Shervo, I had a strange experience today while bowing. Oh, what was it? And I told him the story and he got this, uh, you know, 100 foot stare in the 10 foot room kind of looking out. And he said, oh, so it's that time again, huh? And I said, sure, fool. He said, too much false thinking. Just be more sincere. Go bow, you know. So I was like, mm. so that was that was the first time that I I knew there was more to what was going on than I knew. And uh so then uh, I asked him later if I could, because uh, in our tradition, we have this three steps, one bow practice, um, which was exemplified by our, my grand teacher, Master Empty Cloud, Master Xu Yun, his name was, lived to be 120, uh, probably the most uh, renowned Chan monk in a couple centuries, Empty Cloud. And he did a three steps, one bow pilgrimage from Putoshan on the East China Sea all the way across to Wutaishan, so 3,000 Chinese miles, uh, to repay his mother's kindness for giving him birth. She died in his, in his birth, giving birth to him. So that was his motive for bowing. So I'd heard of this. And I have to say, we had already had two bhikshus from Gold Mountain do a three steps, one bow pilgrimage. Bhikshu Hangju and Hang Yo, my former roommate, took off from Gold Mountain and bowed to Seattle and then on to Marble Mount, Washington. Uh, it took them nine months. He went very fast. And so they, I had already known of this practice. And we had uh, uh, a brand new monastery in Los Angeles, our first branch called Gold Wheel. So I asked Master Hua Shifu, I said, could I? said, I really, really want to, uh, to, to bow to the sutra. The Avatamsaka Sutra has drawn me into the door of the monastery, kind of like an iron filing to a magnet. Could I bow to the sutra from our new monastery? And he said, well, he said, 
City of 10,000 Buddhas is about to be realized. 1976 was when we acquired it. He said, it's going to take a lot of sacrifice to, to make that monastery real, to, make, to realize it. It's going to take a lot of strength. You think you have enough strength to, to land that monastery? You know, do you have enough blessings? Can you generate blessings? And I said, uh, absolutely not. <laughs> he said, yeah, that's, that's correct. You don't. But where do blessings come from? They come from cultivation. So, so if you want to do that, but you can't go now because he's not here yet. And I said, who's sure? He said, never mind. Too much false thinking. Just go bow and be sincere. That was his answer. So every time. So from the time I first mentioned it to him till when the pilgrimage began was about, uh, about six months. And one person came and heard about my plan, my vow to do that. And he said he wanted to go. And Master Hua said, wait. And this, this uh, monastic turned out to be not the right one. And he came and left. Then uh, Marty Verhoeven, Hung Chao, showed up. And the day he came in the monastery, the phone rang. And it's unusual. Here's a young guy who came in. And he had a Pendleton shirt, just exactly like a Pendleton shirt that I was wearing, uh, that I had worn when I was a layman. And he had a mustache, uh, the same color as a mustache that I had worn as an official hippie back in the 60s. He was driving a pickup truck, similar to a pickup truck that I had driven. He was a guitar player, and I had played guitar as a limb. And so this here was a guy who, uh, you know, was kind of living the same lifestyle that I had lived. The phone rang. And Sherpa said, uh, well, John, uh, Sherpa? Uh, has anybody come? Uh, yes, actually, sure. Uh, there's a new young man here. Sherpa sure, says, tell him to come to lecture tonight. <laughs> okay, you want to come to the lecture tonight? Oh, what's the lecture? He says, okay, sure. Yeah. So that night, uh, Master Hua called us out and said, uh, Guo Jun, what are you waiting for? Why aren't you going to make your stupid vow in front of everyone? Uh, uh, okay, sure. Well, you told me not do it now. So I made my vow. And so uh, Marty Verhoeven, who had come in the door that day said this is really strange he said i i think i'm supposed to go with him he said is that possible after i made my vow to bow from go wheel monastery to city the city of 10000 buddhas that barely existed at that point so so that's how it started so long answer to your question again but it seems like there some things are are arising from from the eighth consciousness when the time is right i don't know a bit mysterious so mm. yeah yeah thank you so much uh dharma master yeah amazing stories and uh for anyone who hasn't yet read his journals there uh yeah he and uh reverend hung chow i mean amazing amazing stories um yeah i'm, I'm curious you just mentioned uh like the vow that you made and um yeah that's uh in the mahayana class that I'm in right now, where we've just started the uh, longer Sukhavati, the um, Pure Land, the longer Pure Land Sutra. And um, yeah, reading about um, Dharma Kara's, his, his vows that he made. And um, yeah, it's impressive. It's, it's a whole nother layer, layer way of making vows. You know, most Americans were used to like, I'm going to vow not to eat chocolate for you know a week and he's like i'm gonna vow to make a whole universe basically um, but I'm, I'm curious if you could speak more about vows because obviously that was that's been something which has really uh powered and charged your your whole monastic life maybe your whole life i remember one vow which i was especially impressed by if i'm remembering correctly that you uh have vowed and aspire to not only for the rest of this life but for all future lives until you uh, attain awakening to, to be a monastic, to be celibate. I'm curious if you could speak about vows in general or just the vow to yet yeah, to stay in robes and to, to be a monk yeah. for. Um, so vows are, uh, and I'll, so one of, the, one of the joys of my life as a monk is finding brotherhood with the Thai Forest Sangha. 
um, from uh, my earliest. Well, I'll I'll tell the story, uh, and then I'll I'll get to your to your question specifically. But I want to give a context for it. Um, three steps, one bow had finished. It was now 1980. We arrived at City of Ten Thousand Buddhas, 1979. And it was time for the winter Chan retreat. We did 21 days in the winter of uh, 12 hours of sitting a day, uh, sitting and walking, sitting and walking. We do an hour of sitting and 20 minutes of walking and an hour of sitting. And we were in day number six or seven and everybody was really, you know, in that kind of uh, uh, sleeping Samadhi, you know, half awake, half asleep and, and uh, fuzzy, fuzzy head. Um, and the door opened and in came Master Hua and a tall American bhikkhu in robes exactly like yours, Ajahn Sumedho. And the two of them walked around and it was very much the sense that Shrifu was, Master Hua was proudly showing, saying, yeah, we, we do this, they'll, they'll be here for another couple of weeks. Uh, and so we're like, we were, you know, we're not supposed to be looking, you know, we're supposed to be sitting there, but here's this, you know, wow, here's this very tall bhikkhu, who's this? And uh, so Robert Jackman, you know, the, as a Californian, is Ajahn Sumedho. So um, that uh, after the, the session was over, Shrifu said, you can take him as your role model in cultivation. He, is, uh, he has been through a drought in India. He's been through a famine. He's uh, made strong vows. He and I have been fellow cultivators in past lives. He said, the Chinese word is Tong Chan Dao Yo. It's fellow Chan monks, friends along the Dao, friends along the path. So, and uh, you think, well, that's interesting. How does Master Hua know that? You know, so you, well, you just, you just assume that he knows things like that. So if you look at Ajahn Sumedho's life, he had plans to go to China for college, but was prevented. Yeah. So uh, ask him about his connection with Chinese culture and Chinese language that because of the fall of the bamboo curtain, he wasn't able to go to Shanghai to study. So anyway, interesting story. So hmm, how does, you know, hmm, interesting. So, all right. Um, as I say, one of the joys of my life as a monk is the connection with, and the, the ability to learn from the resolve and from the vigor and the purity of the Theravada tradition and the uh, uniformity of the Sangha order and how the, the, the vows of simplicity. I mean, you could say precepts are vows. So every time you do the patimokkha, those are vows. You know, yo panabhikkhu, right? What's the difference? What is a vow? A vow is a thought that arises from the mind that says, I will do this. And I'm, interestingly, this is funny, uh, synchronicity. I'm explaining every week the Flower Garland Sutra. I, I'm aware, right, I have a glass sliding door right beside me, and there is a brush-tailed possum uh, right outside eating the leftover bird seed. So I'm hearing the noise of my possum. There's a mother with the baby on her back. So it's, I don't know if the, my microphone is picking up the random noises, but it's a possum outside. So anyhow, um, as I lecture on the Avatamsaka Sutra every, uh, every week, um, I'm at a, the chapter called the Dasha Bhumi, the 10 stages chapter, known as the 10 grounds or the 10 stages. It describes the Bodhisattva path. And so instead of, I understand that the, you know, in the Theravada tradition, the Bodhisattva is not emphasized. The Arhat, the Shravaka is emphasized. That's okay. These are complementary stories. So I'm not going to try to, uh, I'm going to speak as I would to brothers and just, you know, uh, understand that there are, we all have, uh, there, we haven't learned all the stories yet. I'm investigating the Pali Suttas with vigor 
and I would love to share the Mahayana Sutras vigorously. So I just, I'll just, you know, without, I'll apologize once and then pull it off the table and say, let's, let's study our own, study each other's stories, all right? So um, the place where I am currently, in fact, last Sunday, three days ago, uh, I was explaining vows in the first stage out of 10. The bodhisattva on the first stage called the stage of happiness makes vows. And I looked in a commentary from the Tang dynasty. It's called the Avatamsaka commentary and subcommentary by a monk called Chengguan. National master clear and cool was the name the emperor gave him, Qingliang Guoshi. And I, I researched what is a vow because this, there's a giant section of text about vows. And what I learned fresh after 46 years of dealing with this, I saw it for the first time just in my research for this week, was Master Chengguan from the Tang Dynasty 1300 years ago saying, the point about the vow is the Bodhisattva is actually seeking something that he doesn't have yet. It is a wish he, is, he or she is seeking they are putting their feet on the path because this is the direction they're going. So a vow is like a compass heading. Okay, we're heading southwest. We're heading due east. And we're not there yet. So the bodhisattva is the, the, the goal that he seeks to, uh, the, there are 10 in the list, and he vows to always turn the wheel of dharma. That's one. And then it's, it goes into details. That's one of the vows. He vows to always teach living beings. And the living beings are listed. There's all, you know, born from wombs, born from eggs, born, you know, that the list. So another vow, he vows to always um, explore and master the bodhisattvas practices as they are. So in other words, he's going to become a great meditator. He's going to become a great precept holder. He's going to become a great giver, a donor. Uh, the first of the 10, he vows to always practice giving. So he's going to be a master uh, donor to the Buddha, to, you know, to his teachers, to living beings, you know. So, so these are the vows and what's going on in the sutra, and this is maybe more of a detailed answer than you were looking for, but the, the idea is the 10 stages chapter is the entirety of the bodhisattva's path from first step to success. And in the first stage, this is the foundation. So the foundation is where he says, okay, north, we're going north, we're going south. This is where we're going. And the, the path is to be walked. So the vow is what he has not yet realized, but seeks to, to realize. And that was like, huh. And we have, Master Hua has uh, a list of what are called the six guidelines of the city of 10,000 Buddhas. And number three is no seeking. <laughs> so, oops, wait, wait, but no seeking. But a vow is about seeking what you have not realized and what's the difference so my understanding of the difference is the no seeking ties into a sense of the seven year itch discontent uh i'm you know i want to uh i've, I've heard that uh you know we're kind of long hours here in the monastery and uh I think I'd like to actually check out Facebook, you know, let me get a Facebook account because I'm told that there's like, you know, so that kind of, that kind of seeking the, the wish to fulfill, to, to fulfill uh, desire, you know, sparked by desire, self seeking. That's that. And the, the reason I understand Master Hua's third guideline of no seeking is the antidote is contentment. 
contentment says, yeah, I've got exactly what my karma has brought me. I've got exactly what I've earned through my bank account of blessings and offenses that I'm that power me karmically, you know. And if I want something different, go out and earn it, go out and cultivate, go out and do the work to get. So that's contentment. The bodhisattva's vows arise from a place of selflessness, of I need to learn how to give so I can teach. I need to turn the Dharma wheel so I have to study. I need to protect these bodhisattva's practices so I'm going to dig into them, you know. That's, that's a difference. So it's self-indulgent or self-transcending. That's the difference. So that's what vows are. Amitabha's vows, uh, what a dreamer. So Dhammakara, you said Fazang, was this mythical character who said, um, I am not content in a world that is zero sum, where if I take a piece of the pie, you don't get it. You know, a world of duality. I'm not content. I'm going to build a world without duality. I'm going to build a world where uh, suffering is over. And then he goes out from that vow. Anyone who recites my name can come with me, can be there. And we will together create this world without dukkha, you know. And so it, when I heard that, I, I have to say I am not an adherent of the Pure Land. I, I respond to Guanyin Bodhisattva has always been my kind of load star, my, my pole star, is the compassion of Guanyin Bodhisattva, who is connected to the Pure Land, but I, I am not one who recites the name of Amitabha all day long, and yet at the Berkeley Monastery, we have Jin Fu, our, our elder Taiwanese monk, who it just never stops reciting, and he is totally devoted to teaching Amitabha in the Pure Land. So, it's what I understand how, you know, so I think it's great that, that uh, Venerable Nisap, uh, Venerable uh, Kovilo, you're, you know, picking up the, the larger Sakavati Vyuha and just learning about it and, and just saying this, this, this story is here in Buddhism too. The way I understand it is um, there are yogas, right? There is Raja Yoga, which has to do with meditation. There's Bhakti Yoga, which is devotion. There is karma yoga, which is service. You know, there is uh, uh, hatha yoga, which is, you know, exercise and strength. And so some people respond to a devotional message. And that's where the pure land comes in. Others are completely do-it-yourselfers. That's the Chan path. Other people want to master the Vinaya to purify the body and mind and mouth you know so it's it is a path and that particular story the way the way we tell it in the mahayana is um among the 12 divisions of the tripitaka uh there is one division that's called spoken without request all the other sutras came after someone asked they said you know uh they did the pali request to to the buddha and, and uh, or whatever language was current. And the Buddha spoke to resolve their problems, to answer their questions, to, to bring blessings, et cetera. You know? um, at one point, according to the Mahayana tradition, the Buddha said, no, I have a story that you all don't know. Sit down, get out your notebooks, you know, turn on your digital recorder, because I'm going to tell you about the vows of Amitabha. So that was spoken without request, the only time. So that's, that's the way our tradition tells it. Reverend, uh, thank you so much for, for this. And I, I know that um, it's getting late there, possums and all, but uh, we do have one more question, if we may. Only one. You had that long list. We'll have to do this again. I'm sorry. I, I answered too long. I was hoping to get through the whole list. I don't think you answered too long. It's been great to actually have each one delved into and hear all the stories. So it, it's been what lovely. And the I actually hadn't written this question down, but after listening to you, it's what's coming up for me is we exist in the shadows of these masters. Mm. You know, you spoke of the lineage you come from, which um, at least in the last 200 years begins with Shu Yun, who 
lived until he was 120. I believe he lived on river water and pine needles for two years. Pretty much. Burned his, uh, what? Pretty much. Yeah. And yeah. Burned his finger off. Yeah. Burned his finger off for his mother. Um, was survived three beatings by Maoist thugs when he was about 100 years old. And he um, died. He died and came back, they say. That's, you know. <laughs> so there's <laughs> that. <laughs> back to a broken body, you know. So. So, yeah, so, so, bad. and yeah. then, and then his disciple of, and basically revived Chinese Buddhism. And then his disciple, Master Hua, who was your teacher, you know, these astounding stories of living by his parents' grave for two years, was it? In a grass hut, three years in a grass hut as an act of filial devotion. We exist in the shadow of uh, Ajahn Mun, Ajahn Cha, and we all exist in the shadow of the Buddha. So it strikes me that spiritual, um, strengths might manifest differently in a, in a modern person than they did in those previous generations. We tend to think more, um, perhaps be less located exactly in our hearts. But even with that being acknowledged, I'm just curious, how do we carry on and, and honor and embody that? Um, how do we exist in that shadow or rise to I mean, not that, you know, one would ever presume to rise to any level like that, but how do we, you know, are, is, is, are these subsequent years fated to be us, um, you know, subsequent generations really just, you know, echoing these, these songs, which you've heard, you know, metaphorically years before, um, what, what do we, how do we exist with that dynamic? Right. So that's a really good question. And I have two, two thoughts. One is um, Master Hua at one point said to me, uh, you're never going to be Chinese. He said, don't even try to imitate my old Chinese ways. They simply won't work here in this country at this time. You have to use every skill you have to interpret the Buddhist teaching for your culture, for your time. Then he added a sentence. He said, you know, a monk who could play a guitar in this culture would really be helpful, he said. And I said, no, Shervo, I'm totally attached. I have to sell my guitar. And I, and Master Hua said, stupid, he said. So anyway, that's another story. So um, the, the bigger response, that, that's a personal issue. So about music and the Dharma. Um, the... Anybody who has ever set forth, gone forth from the householder's life, at some point had a realization. Doesn't matter whether it's Prince Siddhartha, whether it's Ajahn Mun, you know, whether it's monks to come after us. I think that the place where that happens is the mind and the realization that there is more than simply pursuing pleasure, running from pain, a life of consuming, there's, there's more. That realization, I think, is the same, male or female, ancient, modern, into the future. So I have no worries that people to come will, that men and women in the future will no longer uh, have that identical moment of awareness the um if you'll allow me the uh in the mahayana jargon we're we're doing one of the things that that we're doing at the berkeley monastery in particular we're calling it decoding the dharma the chinese have a genius for capturing essences into those chinese characters and a lot of the dharma comes down in four character phrases uh that are just little adamantine crystals of wisdom but they're kind of like tea leaves that you bounce them into the teacup. If you put cold water on them, there's no flavor. You have to actually decode them. You have to have hot water before you get a beverage out of them. So the hot water is actual practice of those. We're decoding the Dharma through practice. So one of those jargon phrases that I heard was called the Bodhi Resolve, the Bodhi Chitta. In Chinese, it's called Putishin. And the, the jargon, the four character phrase was shang, shang, fo dao, xia hua, zhong shang. 
It said, above accomplishing Buddhahood, below teaching living beings. And so undecoded, the tea leaves and cold water is the Buddha's up there, and I want to get there, and living beings are down below, and we have to teach them. And it took me a long time to realize that it wasn't spatial, it was temporal. It was ultimately, I can realize my potential for wisdom. And immediately, I do so by coming to grips with my own habits and faults, the things that cover over my Buddha nature. So all of the men and women from past until present and on into the future who aspire to step out of the shadows of the greats and to walk their same path do so at one point by saying, what is my potential? What am I capable of? PhD, two PhDs, great wealth, a dozen children, all good. You know, that's not, not, not to diminish that in the least, but there's more. And the Dharma, the Vinaya Dhamma, gives us the direction. And what I love, I did a, I've taught years and years and years of Buddhist Christian dialogue at the university and the seminary and undergraduate classes, graduate classes. And one of the things that makes the most sense to people when I explain what is different about Buddhism is the direction of the search. Once you catch the, that insight that I, like all Buddhas of the past, present, and future, have that nature intact, no, nothing less, nothing more, I have that potential inside for wisdom and compassion, then the Dharma says, it's not out there. It is not a theistic search. We're not looking for, for God on high or Gaia even. We're looking within. You turn the search around. That's unique, I think, among religions. So we, look, we go there, but once we get there, we realize, wow, I meditate and my mind is just on fire and I can't sit still. You say, yep, so start. That's what the practices are. And the vows keep you going. The vows are the direction and the uh, promise, the strength of that thought. I will continue until I find the real gold. And I'm going to dig in the mine ground. I'm going to plant the mine ground with wholesome seeds of wisdom and compassion nurture it with the water of blessings and harvest the fruit of awakening on behalf of all the people who've been kind to me and who's who I would love to to repay with some some insight and some humor so that's that's I think how we how I'm not afraid that somehow you know uh, we've we're we're only walking around in a museum of the past greats you know I think we go out, leave the museum and, and take our Dharma out onto the steps of the museum and, and uh, mm. you know, tell the stories out there. Dharma Master, can we sneak in one or two more questions or? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, me and my possum are, <laughs> not nothing to do but Chad, I, I really, I, I appreciate your, you know, the opportunity to share and it's nice to get to know both of you as well. Yeah, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, these are, wonderful reflections to think on so definitely you know a huge part of the the monastic life is is just sitting with ourselves as you as you say um one kind of emergent i mean it's it's been emerging for the whole time i've been in robes but um one really important um auxiliary or like supporting uh condition basically like um one enjoyable part of being a monk has been language study. So this actual literal, you know, decoding of the Dharma, whether it's Thai, I mean, Nisibo and I have both, uh, you know, lived in Thailand, studied Thai, uh, studied Pali, uh, starting to study Sanskrit. And I'm curious if you would be able to, to say, um, or speak on, on your experience of the Dharma door of translation. I mean, you're totally fluent in, in Chinese and, have translated many different discourses and uh, how that is a an integral part of your your monastic life or, or what what role does it serve is it is it a, a hobby is it a side thing like if you if one can't meditate you know 24 hours a day 
then, you know, we've got to have some kind of, you know, thing on the side, or is it really one in the same with, with the, the, with this formal sitting practice? Um, how much, how much time should I devote to this answer? Is this a five minute answer or a 10 minute answer? Or You know, really we, we can go as, as long as you want. We, Tan and I also have time. So, um, okay. yeah. Okay, great. It's what, 3 a.m. where you are? My goodness. <laughs> so, um, so in fact, language was the door that led me to the Dharma. People say, how did you, how did you go from becoming a Methodist uh, mid, mid-American kid in Toledo, Ohio to a Buddhist monk? And the answer was Chinese language. Um, and again, I have to say, it's a little bit mysterious. I think I must have been Chinese in a past life. I don't know that, I don't see it, but I have some evidence that that is the case because I grew up completely immersed in baseball, television, uh, girlfriends, and uh, you know I was a four sport athlete. I was a jock and I had no connection to Asia whatsoever, except my auntie, my mother's older sister and friend who worked in Washington DC in the uh, USIA, United States Information Agency, which, which gave birth to uh, Voice of America, among other things, you know, that was a, a government funded agency that, that uh, she was a journalist and produced articles. Whenever there was anything happening in Washington DC around Asian culture, that was her beat. She would go and, and uh, report on it. And she sent me a catalog from a Chinese painters exhibit that was at the Freer Gallery or somewhere. And uh, I opened it up and I looked at these landscapes and there was Chinese characters on the side. And as I looked at them, I think I was 13 years old, something went click. And I turned the, turned it sideways and I turned it upside down and I knew there was meaning there but I had no clue. These were fascinating structures, the ideograms, the Chinese, the, the Japanese call them kanji, the Chinese call them hanzi, they're Chinese characters. So uh, I went to the local public library. I used to, I was a reader as a kid and I haunted the local public library. And there at my little branch library in Toledo was the Asian religions shelf, <laughs> three books, <laughs> three total, three books. One of them was Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. I don't know if people run to the prophet, but next to that, I read that. And next to that was uh, a book by uh, was Seton Hall University Press, or St. John's, St. John's University Press in New Jersey. And it was bilingual and it was the Tao Te Ching, the Lao Tzu, mm-hmm. the founding, one of the founding texts of Taoism, Chinese indigenous religion. And I opened it up. And sure enough, it was bilingual, Chinese English facing. And here was a page of clearly printed Chinese characters. Um, and it said in the English, and I was fascinated to go character to, China, to, to ABCs, Chinese characters, ABCs across the pages. And it said, the way that you can walk is not the eternal way. Uh, the, the way that you can name is not the eternal way. The uh, name that you can name is not the eternal name. When you is Dao Ke Dao Fei Chang Dao Ming Ke Ming Fei Chang Ming Yu Ming Tian Di Zhi Shi Wu Ming Wan Mu Zhi Mu said, when it has a name, Yu uh, Ming Tian Di, it is the beginning of heaven and earth. When it is nameless, it is the mother of all things. And I I could just feel something fill up inside, and I said, I think I've found my tribe. I think this is where I belong. And I had, I had no connection with Sunday school stories of Jesus. Anything that took me to the Middle East, that took me to sand and dates and sheep and goats, I didn't resonate. It wasn't where I belonged. But as soon as it changed to valleys and rivers and mountains and the cosmos and yin and yang, it was that's coming from inside. That's me. And so I took the Dao Te Ching to my long-suffering Sunday school teacher, who was a, the volunteer parent of one of my classmates. You know, his name was Mr. Alley. Poor Mr. Alley. I said, Mr. Alley, tell me, here it says, you know, the, uh, 
the Tao is like the eternal feminine. Its use is unending and it comes from what is not there. It comes from the absence. That's the power of it. Could you explain that? And he said, you can't ask that question here. And I, I was like, oh, I, I've got to go somewhere where I can ask this question because I've got to know, you know, the poor man. He, he was like, I laid that on him. So what a blessing. My, uh, the pastor of the Methodist, Ep Epworth Methodist Church in Toledo was a man named Phil, Phil Trope, Paul Trope. Wonderful man. And he said, son, he said, I don't think we're going to be able to keep you here. Please go on with my blessings and let us know what you find, he said. So uh, I did. I went back to the library and put that volume down. I picked up the next one. That's the third book on the Asian religion shelf. And it was the Six Patriarchs Dharma Jewel Platform Sutra, St. John's University Press, Chinese English Facing. And I picked it up and looked at the Chinese and looked at the English, and I felt as if I had been talking to the sixth patriarch on the phone that morning. It was that close. It was so familiar. It felt like it was coming from inside my heart. And I said, this, I need to know what this is about. So how amazing is the public library system in America that all it took was for me to encounter these texts, for me to suddenly kind of transcend time and space and kind of find my home. Uh, I felt immediately related to the wisdom on these two pages, whereas years of Sunday school teachings hadn't caught my heart yet. It, and it wasn't the fault of anyone. It was just, I sense a sense of identity. Anyway, so luckily, amazingly, Toledo, Ohio opened the third high school program for teaching Mandarin Chinese that existed in 1962. There were only three. And it was because of a man named John Campbell, who had been a Green Beret assigned to Taiwan, fell in love with Chinese culture, came home, uh, uh, retired from the military, and started the Sino-Soviet Study Center in the Toledo Public Schools located in my high school. So as a junior in high school, I took Mandarin Chinese as an elective. And along with French, I was no good at science and math, but I had an ear for language. So I was taking French and Chinese. And my parents did not say, oh, what a waste of time. You know, what do you think you're doing? You'll never make an earning a living with that. They didn't. They said, well, that will broaden you. Go ahead and study. So from that moment, uh, as a junior in high school, I studied Chinese consistently every summer. I went to Middlebury College for Middlebury's summer language program, two years in Chinese, one year in Japanese. I followed Chinese through undergraduate school, then on to UC Berkeley. And you could say I'm still studying it to this day. Mm -hmm. So 50 plus years of studying Mandarin, and it opens up. I learn new words every single day. Uh, I love Chinese language. And here's another, if I, you know, as I, I apologize profusely for telling a mystical story, because I don't want people to come to the Dharma out of mysteries, you know, but to deny it is also not accurate. So there are things about the path that I think are, that are, uh, that are go beyond knowledge, that go beyond language and, and thought. So there are some inconceivable aspects to the Dharma for sure. So one of the inconceivable aspects of the Dharma in my life was my connection to the Avatamsaka Sutra. Can't explain it, but uh, I, had, I had set up in the Berkeley Hills being a graduate student and uh, pursuing my MA and my college roommate, Bhikshu Hung Yo called me up and said, hey, he said, uh, why don't you get over Cross the, the Bay Bridge and come over and meet Master Hua, come over to Gold Mountain. And I said, uh, what's the point of that? I said, you're locked into some Hispanic ghetto. I said, I've been to Japan. I know what Zen is. Zen is scooping up stream water without even a cup and eating pine nuts when you're hungry. And I said, I don't want to live in some, you know, downtown 
uh, you know, factory, that's what a waste. He said, you're totally attached. Come and meet the abbot. He's explaining the Avatamsaka Sutra. And I said, what's the Avatamsaka Sutra? Not interested. Hung up the phone. I was deeply immersed in my own dukkha at the time, you know, my attachments. So a year later, I'd been eating my own cooking. I had been uh, kind of coming to the end of the joys of scholarship and uh, without motivation. I didn't know if I wanted, I didn't think I wanted to be a professor. The Vietnam War was going strong and I didn't want to run to Canada, but I didn't want to go die behind a, you know, behind a machine gun shot out of the air in a helicopter and my friends, that was happening to my friends. Uh, so I didn't know what to do. And uh, Bhikshu Hung Yo called again and he said, come and listen to an Avatamsaka lecture. So I, he said, by the way, he said, uh, there's a feast today, vegetarian feast, come on over. How's, how's your own cooking going? And I, uh, okay, I'll see you. How do I get there? So my first introduction to Gold Mountain. So I parked my, my Volvo uh, outside the door and scrambled because it was the 15th street is a tough, tough, tough neighborhood. Uh, the projects are directly across the street and uh, there were gunshots every night. And so anyway, I scuttled across the sidewalk, knocked the door, the door opened and I stepped inside and it was cold inside and I could smell the incense and the air had a quality of stillness. And I could hear the wooden fish. Dun, 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 dun. And I felt this uncanny feeling of all the tension in my body, kind of as if there was a spigot on my toe. And it opened up and all the tension just went out of my body. And a voice inside said, you're back, you're home, go to work. <laughs> I was like, what? So I went back out on the sidewalk immediately. And here was planes going over. The, it's so noisy in the, in the mission that you can't hear the airplanes flying overhead. The ambient traffic noise is so loud that, you know, the buses and the cars and the body shop, Smitty's body shop is right next door. So I'm hearing that, you know, the wheel lug nuts are getting, you know. And so I went, turned around and went back in the monastery and this, this calm descended on my body. And it was as if a knot in my heart opened. I hadn't even known I had a knot tied in my heart and it opened up. And it was like, huh. The Avatamsaka Sutra said Master Hua that night, he said, is like a magnet. And we are like iron filings. And he said, we're here because of past vows to protect the Sutra. And the Sutra draws us in he said. And I had no clue what that meant. I had, that was, that's not a way too mystical for me. And I was, you know, actively trying to, to stay away from, um, you know, a, a converted mattress factory in the mission district. I, I was, and yet being a professor, being a draft dodger, that didn't appeal. So what, what was I to do? And then three years later, I found myself on the highway reciting the name of the Avatamsaka Sutra, Namo Da Fang Guang Fo Hua Jing, reciting a repentance verse from the sutra while I bowed, Hua Yen Hai Hui Fo Pusa, standing up again and doing that probably a million times in a, while holding a vow of silence. And I didn't write letters, didn't read letters, read no books said no words except the Avatamsaka Sutra, which we, that was the only book we had in the car, except for the Six Patriarch Sutra. And so somehow your question is about language. And if I had to say among the various uh, practices of the Dharma, what is my door? You could say it's exploring the Buddha's words. And I, Chinese is my tool I understand a little bit of Japanese and French. I bombed out of Sanskrit at Cal. I don't do inflected languages. I do tonal languages somehow. So that is, you know, language is what brought me in and what holds me to this day. I've been explaining the Avatamsaka Sutra every week for about 
20, almost 30 years now. So my identity in the Dharma comes from language entirely and Chan, those two things. Thank you. Uh, that was really, um, it, it's especially moving for me to hear someone's path into the Dhamma. So thank you so much, Reverend. And I think we'll uh, let um, you get to bed. And uh, we also have our mornings as well. But you've given us over an hour and a half of your time. And I just want to express how grateful we are. Uh, and what a pleasure it's been to spend the time and to hear everything you've said. I appreciate that. And again, thank you for the, the opportunity. And I, if, uh, if I can uh, dedicate any of these comments and any value that there's, I hope I'd like to dedicate it to the continued brotherhood uh, of the, the uh, tradition of the Chan, Mahayana Chan school and the Thai forest tradition. I think um, the every bit that we can do to strengthen our fellowship and our, you know, uh, walk along the path will help the Dharma survive in the times to come. Um, we don't know what's ahead uh, in terms of uh, biodiversity being lost in front of our eyes. Uh, and whether there will be forests for Thai forest monks in the future. Uh, forests may burn here in Australia. We're doing La Nina, but two years ago it was bushfires. Uh, you know, so I think our fellowship and our uh, continued mutual support is a bright light for the, con the continuity of the Dharma into the future. So uh, I'd like to dedicate any goodness that comes from tonight to that to that goal likewise I, I and just to say that i i think the fact that we have a forest um at abayagiri uh where ajin kovilo and i spent ajin kovilo ordained and i've spent time is is due to your teacher um master hua granting us that land and just the beauty of that relationship going um, from from all those years ago so in many ways as that got both of us started on this monastic path it was due to that so notice in my background my virtual background there's a forest this is the bush outside and there's a kookaburra i don't know if you can see him you've got a kookaburra up here in the bush so i'm uh yeah i know and there's the shadow of the greats if it wasn't for master hua's blessings i don't know if if uh yeah, but those those vows run deep, and he and Ajahn Sumedho have had those connections apparently from lives past, so they say. So let's hope that the the ties that we make now will make a new new raft of stories for people in the future. So. Sadhu. All right. Thanks again, both of you. Do you do you have any ceremony to close? Do you do any transference? Ajin Could I? Uh, yes, please, please, Dharma Master, please. All right. So, invite anyone who sees this to please uh, send out any any uh, joy in the Dharma that you may have gotten from and in the series. I know I'm I'm one of many uh, bhikkhus who have been interviewed, and and uh, so please support the series and and uh, let's expand the measure of our minds and uh, let the the goodness. Uh, bring some light to the world. May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. <laughs>